Luke chapter 9, please. Go ahead and open up your Bible to Luke chapter 9. That's where we're going to be tonight in our study. Luke chapter 9. And while you're turning there, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had someone follow you? Not like in the stalkery way, but like they copied you, they mimicked you. So like they liked what you liked. So if you like a certain hobby, well, well they kind of liked it too. Or if you like to watch a certain TV show, they like that TV show too. If you like a certain video game or something along the lines, well, they like that video game too. I guess the most applicable way you see this is sort of with an older sibling. An older sibling may have gone through something like this where maybe their younger sibling seems like they're just copying them, right? So the, old, the, the younger sibling wants to do everything that the older sibling does. They want to like the same things. I don't know if any of you older siblings have, has, have gone through that, but I feel like I've gone through that a little bit, throwing my little brother under the bus. It seems like, you know, and a lot of people say, man, he looks like, just like you whenever you, were, whenever you were little. I don't know, maybe, okay. But he does like some of the things that I like. Like he watches Dragon Ball Z, and I like to watch Dragon Ball Z when I was his age. You know, Dragon Ball, if you know, you know. I'm not going to explain Dragon Ball Z. Uh, Kingdom Hearts, he likes that. That's a video game. He likes... What else? He likes coding, you know, and I'm a, I program sort of by hobby. And so it seems like he's just kind of following me, like he's just copying me. And some of you might be saying, well, why are you even bringing this up? What does this have to do with Luke chapter 9? Honestly, this is just a silly example for me to say, God wants us to follow him. Jesus wants us to follow him. Uh, Jesus wants our likes to be, to be his likes. Jesus wants our way of life to be his way of life. We see this in Luke chapter 9. We're going to read verse 57. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. It says, as they were going along the road, this is Jesus and his disciples going along the road, someone said to him, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, this guy has the right idea. He wants to follow Jesus wherever he goes, and that's what Jesus wants from us. Jesus wants us to follow him wherever he goes. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, because following Jesus wherever he goes is not just as simple as saying, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. It's it's not quite that simple. There are some things that go along with it, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm not going to take up a lot of your time because I went a little long this morning. I'm going to give you some of that time back tonight. I'm a nice guy. I'm going to give you some of that time back. But in this lesson, we're going to talk about this idea of following Jesus wherever he goes and what that means for us. If we're going to follow Jesus, there are some things we need to understand. There are some things that we need to expect. And really, we find these things in the text. So let's jump into the lesson. What do we need to understand? What do we need to expect if we're going to follow Jesus? Well, if we follow Jesus, then we need to count the cost. We see this early on in this section. Uh, Start again in verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So this guy tells Jesus, hey, I want to follow you. And Jesus' response is kind of weird. It's it's a strange response. It's not what you would expect. Uh, As a matter of fact, if you want people to, to join your cause... That's not what you say. You don't say, oh, well, the wild beasts of the field are living better than I am. That's not your sales pitch. So uh, what Jesus says is strange. It's a little unexpected. And I'm sure this guy thought that it was unexpected. This guy that Jesus is talking to, that's probably not what he expected. Because like the rest of the disciples, they expected Jesus to do some pretty great things. They expected Jesus to sort of usher in this this revolution. He would be this conquering king who would build a new kingdom. They expected Jesus to do all of these great things. But instead, Jesus tells this man, look, the animals, the birds are doing better than me. What Jesus is really doing here is he's, he's asking this man, have you really counted the cost? 
That's really what Jesus is doing, because this man needed to know what he was getting into. He needed to know that if we're going to follow Jesus, that we need to count the cost. And the, the same is true of us. You know, that's not only true in the ancient world, it's true today. And let me give you some reasons why we need to count the cost. Just three reasons why we need to count the cost. First of all, we need to count the cost, because if we don't, we can fall into this trap of fake Christianity and serving a fake Jesus. You guys know what I'm talking about whenever I say that, fake Christianity and serving a fake Jesus? You see, some people don't know what to expect. Some people don't know, excuse me, some people don't know what God expects from them. Let me put it that way. Some people don't know what God expects from them. Some people don't know what Jesus expects from them. So since they didn't count the cost, they just kind of make it up. They make up their own Jesus and their own Christianity. I mean, we see this in the world. We see this in the religious world where there are no rules, where some people follow a Jesus who says, well, you can just do whatever you want. If you want to live in a moral life, you know what? You can do that. If, if you, you know, want to have sex before marriage, you can do that. If you want to be homosexual, whatever, that's on you. You can do that. Some people serve this fake Jesus where there is no rules. Hey, you don't want to read scripture? That's fine. We'll take you anyway. See, if we don't count the cost, we don't truly know what God expects from us. We serve a fake Jesus. But that's not the only reason we need to count the cost. We also need to count the cost because if we don't count the cost, we might find ourselves looking back. And Jesus, in this context, says that those who look back aren't worthy. They aren't worthy to be in the kingdom. Let's, uh, in verse 62 of Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So Jesus is telling this man, you know, if you start working, you start working in the kingdom, but then you're, you're looking back at the life that you used to have. See, then you are not worthy. This was the problem that Lot's wife had. You know, typically we we learn in Bible class, Lot's wife, she was turned into this pillar of salt, and it's because she looked back, and we don't really, I guess, go into detail about why Lot's wife looked back. Because she did. She looked back, and typically what we think is, oh, we think she was curious. She wanted to know what was going on back in Sodom and Gomorrah, she wanted to see the fire in the, in the brimstone. But that's not why Lot's wife looked back. Lot's wife looked back because she missed the life that she had back in Sodom and Gomorrah. She missed the old life, and she didn't want to put away that old life. And that's why she was looking back. Jesus makes this point in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, let's go there. This is where where Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Luke chapter 17 in verse 32. So Jesus says here, remember Lot's wife. But then the next verse sort of gives us more information about what Jesus is talking about. He says, whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. Now Jesus isn't, whenever he says this, he isn't necessarily talking about like our physical life. Whoever loses his his physical life, like dies, will save his life. That's not necessarily what Jesus is talking about. Rather, Jesus is talking about lifestyle. Whoever refuses to put aside their lifestyle, their old way of life, they're going to end up losing. But whoever is willing to put away that old way of life, that old man, well, they will be the ones who truly gain life. So what was Lot's wife's problem? Her problem was she wanted that old life. She was looking back. She wasn't content with what we had, or with what she had. Uh, if we're going to be honest, if we're missing the world like that, if we're looking back at our old way of life, what we're really saying is that God's not good enough. That's what we're really saying. We're saying God is not good enough. We know, you know, I know you've offered me so much, Lord, but I need something else. I need what's back there. That's what we're saying. It's really, it's a, it's a heart issue. 
So why should we count the cost? Well, we need to count the cost because if we don't, we'll find ourselves looking back and those who look back are not worthy. But let me give you one more reason. Why should we count the cost? We need to count the cost because if we don't count the cost, we won't be ready. And those who are not ready tend to fail. Uh, This is why professional sports teams practice, right? They practice so that they're ready for what's in front of them. So that when the game day happens, they're prepared. This is why, you know, you, police SWAT teams, they practice, a good SWAT team, they practice, they practice all the time. So whenever they go in someone's house and they run a warrant, they're ready. It's so that they don't fail. Well, that's true of us also. We need to count the cost so that we know what's in front of us, so that we are ready for what's in front of us, so that we don't fail. If we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to follow Jesus wherever he goes, then we need to count the cost. But that's not all we see in Luke chapter 9. If we're going to follow Jesus, here's another point. We also should expect to give up our wants. Let's go back to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 57 again. Luke chapter 9 and verse 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say to those at my home, or let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So here, just sort of reading the story as a whole, we see that there are some people who wanted to follow Jesus. They wanted to follow the Savior, but they had some other things that they wanted to do first. One man says, well, let me go bury my father first, and then I'll follow you. Another man says, well, let me go say goodbye to my family, and then I'll follow you. And Jesus essentially tells them, well, no, you got to follow me because my cause is more important. As a matter of fact, he says, essentially, he's saying my cause is is most important. Well, there's one thing that I want you guys to notice with me about what these people were requesting. The things that these people were requesting, burying the father and saying goodbye to family, Those were both important things. You know, we would consider those things important today. You know, if if we said, you know, I want to go bury my father, and Jesus said, no, you follow me instead. That's a big deal, because burying family, burying your father, that's an important thing. And it would be considered highly disrespectful if you didn't do that. That's very important. And that was even more important in the ancient world, because they were more of a uh, communal culture, and we are more of an individualistic culture, but they would have seen that as a, as a great offense. That would have been a societal requirement. Let me put it that way. That would have been less of a want for them and more of a need. And same for, for saying goodbye to your family. Saying goodbye to your family in the ancient world, if you didn't do that, that would have been highly disrespectful. That would have been like a cultural requirement, essentially a need. And it wasn't a, an unreasonable request either. We see something similar in the book of 1 Kings. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, in that context, we see the prophet Elijah. We see the prophet Elijah in this context, and he needs a little bit of help. So uh, he, he seeks out Elisha, 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 19. It says, So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yoke of oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So when Elijah calls Elisha, Elisha says, Okay, yeah, I'll follow you. 
But let me say goodbye to my family first. And it seems like Elijah is a little offended that he even asked the question. Of course, go say goodbye to your family. This was something that Elijah understood. Elijah understood that Elisha needed to go say goodbye to his family. But what Jesus is saying in Luke chapter 19, Jesus is saying is, I'm more important than all of that. I'm more important than burying a father. I'm more important than saying goodbye to your family. And, and if, if Jesus has this, this instance with Elijah in mind, he's also saying, my cause is more important than Elijah's cause. Jesus' cause is most important. Now, there are some people who might disagree with that, and not necessarily with their words, but with their actions. There are some people who, through their actions, sort of draw this line in the sand. They'll say, look, Jesus, I'll follow you as long as I don't have to lose my family, as long as I don't have to strain my relationship with family. Or they'll say, I'll follow you, Jesus, as long as I don't have to lose out on my old friends, as long as I can keep my old friends. You know, if we have that type of mindset, then we're missing the point that Jesus is making here. I've said it a number of times, I'm going to say it again. His cause is most important. And that means there, we're going to have to give up our wants at times. You know, sometimes there, I'm just going to have to do things that I don't necessarily want to do. Sometimes I'm going to want to get angry and get even. But I remember what Jesus said about loving my enemies. Sometimes I'm going to want to skip out on worship, maybe for something like the Super Bowl or something. But I remember what the Hebrew writer said about not forsaking the assembly. You know, we're going to have to give up our wants sometimes. I think back to Adam and Eve. How would uh, the history of humanity How would the history of humanity have been different if Adam and Eve would have given up their wants in Genesis chapter 3? In Genesis chapter 3, when when Eve looked at the fruit, the text says that she saw it and it was desirable. She saw that it was desirable to make one wise. She saw this fruit. She wanted it. It was desirable to her. But how would the world have been different if Adam and Eve would have given up their wants to follow God? And we've got to recognize that if we're truly devoted to following Jesus, then we are going to have to give up our wants at times. But that's not all. One more point for you. If we're going to follow Jesus, then we should also expect good times. Uh, Immediately after this sort of follow me discourse uh, in verses, in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62, immediately after this in chapter 10, Jesus sends the disciples out. He sends the disciples out to cast out demons. He sends them out to teach the gospel and to, to, heal, to heal the sick. And they're successful. Things go very well with them. We see that in, in chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. And they finally come back to Jesus in verse 17. Verse 17 of Luke chapter 10. And how did they return in verse 17? Let's read it. It says, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. You see, these people are following Jesus, and it seems like they had a pretty good time. They were able to do some good. They were able to teach people the truth. They were able to cast out demons, and they were able to heal people. See, those people had a good time. And imagine being the man who had to give up burying his father. I'm not saying that man was a part of the 72, but what if he was? And he, he just gave up burying his father, but he's out there, he's teaching the gospel, care, uh, casting out demons, healing the sick. How does he feel? Maybe he feels like, man, this is worth it. Following Jesus is worth it because there will be good times. And that's true for us also. Uh, as we follow Jesus, we will find that we will have good times. You know, sometimes we talk about how hard it is to follow Jesus, all of the things we have to sacrifice, and we do have to sacrifice things. But following Jesus also brings good times. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to be able to, like, cast out demons and heal the sick. If you're doing that, we can talk after services because I would want to know a little bit more about that. But we are going to have some good times. You know, there are going to be times where we come home from a singing just smiling because it was a great singing. And we were worshiping the Lord and Roderick Byerly and, and, and oh, who's the other guy? 
Steve Garrett, man, they just burnt the pulpit down. We're going we're gonna to come home smiling because of that sometimes. There will be times where we're smiling, where it's a good day because someone who was lost has decided to come home. If we follow Jesus, then we should expect some good times. But when those good times too, do come, we need to make sure that we're not prideful. This is what Jesus warns the, uh, the people of in Luke chapter 10. Let's go down to verse 20. Verse 20 of Luke chapter 10, he says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Essentially, what Jesus is telling these people is, is don't get too prideful. What he's saying is, look, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Don't rejoice because you're able to do some things, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Instead, rejoice at the things that God, are able to, that God is able to do for you. He says, don't rejoice because you're able to do some things. Don't rejoice in what you have done. Rejoice in what God has done for you. That's what Jesus is telling. And this is something that, that King Nebuchadnezzar missed. King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, uh, let's just go there really quickly. Daniel chapter 4, in this context, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And essentially, the interpretation of the dream is, Nebuchadnezzar, you're being too prideful, so I'm going to drive you away from your kingdom. And that's what Daniel tells him, starting in, in, in verse 25 of Daniel chapter 4. He says, you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Daniel is telling King Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom is going to be taken away from you because you thought or you think that you've built all of this and you need to understand that God is the one who is truly in control. And the thing is, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't really learn. Jumping down to verse 29 or so of Daniel chapter 4, at the end of 12 months, King Nebuchadnezzar was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? And then in verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O Neb King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is, it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you or the kingdom has been taken from you. See, King Nebuchadnezzar looked at his kingdom and he's like, man, look at what I built. And God is reminding him that, no, I built it and I gave it to you. See, we need to remember and we need to rejoice not in the things that we have done, but in the things that God has done for us. Jesus tells us back in Luke chapter 10, reading verse 21, Luke chapter 10 and verse 21, he says, in that same hour he rejoiced, Jesus rejoiced and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. And Jesus tells us in that verse that the prideful are not part of his kingdom. Rather, it is the humble. So what do we need to remember or expect if we follow Jesus? Well, we've got to remember to count the cost. We've got to remember to expect to give up our wants. And we should also expect good times if we follow the Lord. But we shouldn't be too prideful, but we should expect good times. Well, maybe there's someone here tonight who wants to start following Jesus. We've been, we've been talking tonight what to expect if you follow Jesus. But maybe there's someone tonight who wants to start that walk, who wants to enter through the narrow gate, start their walk as a new child of God. We can help you with that. Or maybe there's someone else who realizes that they haven't been giving up their wants. They've just been doing what they want to do, and you haven't been living a life the life that God wants you to live, and you want to come back to him. Well, we'd love to help you with that also. Uh, if you need to respond to the invitation, you can do so now as we stand and as we sing.